Uh, a step back in time in some ways. I know IDF were always trying to look forward, but uh, this is for those of you that wanted to have some more inside scoop of uh, how we really work with the industry to do USB and PCI Express. Uh, so, and PCI. And PCI as well. Uh, let's start where it really started, I guess. Um, so here we have a collection of uh, old codgers from Intel uh, who have worked around I.O. for a number of years. And uh, we're basically here to uh, answer your questions on USB, PCI, PCI Express uh, back from the 90s uh, up to the present day. Um, you know, we've all been involved in I.O. for a number of years now. So Speaking of old codes, Roger Tempery just walked in from HP. Back then he was compact. He was one of the original PCI guys too. That's that was right. a digital. So feel free to share uh, your own recalls and your own nostalgic moments too. Yeah. We'd like to hear this as well. So let's do quick intros. Uh, let's start uh, with Balak the Sun. Sure. Balak and Albi, uh, go back to 1983 when I joined Intel, worked on Multiplus 2, and then uh, started on the plug and play initiative with uh, PCI and, and ISA plug and play. USB 1.0, USB 2.0, wireless USB, USB 3, PCI Express along the way, and a lot of other chip-to-chip uh, -chip interfaces, uh, CPU interfaces, and others. Uh, what I like most is to deliver the technology so that it gets into high volume, uh, delivers uh, usability to the end user, whether it's corporate or consumer, uh, gets all the platform issues in place such that it's a uh, platform technology, not just an island technology, and uh, make sure it's cross-segment and multi-generational, which means that uh, you, know, you put a technology out there, the industry invests in it, and you harvest the investment with uh, two or three uh, tons of the crime uh, generationally, and uh, make sure the economy of scale is something that benefits both the industry and the industry. And now, the one and only, needs no introduction, the real Ajay Bhatt. <laughs> um, joke is in me. Uh, so, Ajay Bhatt. Um, so I've been, I've worked with these gentlemen for uh, my past probably 15 plus years. Um, I've collaborated with uh, Bala on actually ISA plug and play first, um, then on to USB. And then EGP, uh, ESA Express, and now I've joined our client platform group, PC client group, uh, as a lead architect for our client business. Uh, so lately my focus is not so much on, on interconnects. I'm spending uh, more time on platform architecture, all the issues starting with instruction sets, to graphics, to disk subsystem, to power management, and all the other things uh, that are involved in the platform. Um, even though um, in the Intel commercial, um, you know, they're using my name, uh, I think any one of these guys um, would have been just fine. Uh, it just happens that they chose me. But I must say that all the credit belongs to uh, people here on the panel um, and many, many people who worked on um, each of the USB in this case um, and many, many, you know, industry partners who made it happen. Um, uh, it would be wrong for me to just claim that, uh, you know, uh, I was the one who did it. Even in the commercial you may see it that way, but that's not true. So, Yasmin Ayanuj, um, well, I've been riding these buses for 25 plus years. Um, joined Intel in um, 91 and then started actually working on PCI at, at the time and um, as a specification and then implemented a few, several, few of the um, initial chipsets. Uh, recently, my role was mainly PCI Express. That's why I'm here. Uh, Steve Wally, I, I'm currently working on uh, PCI Express 3 at the moment as a kind of initiative manager. Uh, but back in the 90s, I was uh, running a small embedded controller group uh, down in Chandler, Arizona. And Jim and uh, Balar and 
IJ came down and said, you know, they've got this new idea uh, for a serial bus. And uh, they wanted to get the better controller group uh, interested in building uh, peripheral silicon that would go into ultimately, you know, USB products like keyboards, cameras, scanners, etc. So I had the fun job of working with them and then uh, working with the industry, as, uh, as Intel was obviously very focused on getting USB into the chipset. Um, I had the job of going out working with uh, the likes of uh, Logitech on cameras and uh, scanners and things, uh, all the keyboard vendors, uh, a lot of the hub vendors. Uh, we ended up making uh, peripheral silicon both from a device point of view and a hub point of view and actually uh, you know, did a lot of the enabling side. And then uh, I guess at some point I uh, took the banner from, I uh, took the torch from Jim who was the head of the USB implementers forum at the time and then and ran that for a while as well. I'm Jim Pappas. Um, uh, back in 1991, I worked on this goofy little project called LGB, Local Glueless Bus, and probably nobody's ever heard of that. And it, we soon turned, changed the name to uh, PCI. And it was, um, uh, I was at Digital Equipment at the time, rest in peace. And, uh, uh, actually, Roger Tibley, who is sitting here, was the uh, compact guy. Uh, now, H compact now rest in peace. You know, you know HP, um, and we worked our butts off to make PCI happen. That was really. Previously, I was a, a chip designer, a graphics architect, and uh, uh, that was kind of my foray into the into the heart of the PC industry. Um, as as PCI was ramping and becoming successful. Um, Craig Kinney, some of you may remember, he was a, a senior executive vice president at Intel, called me up one day and says, hey, we really liked working with you on PCI, can you come in and form this thing called USB? Actually, it wasn't even called USB at the time. So I came and I, we, we started the finding, I worked with, with Bava, with, with, with Ajay, and, and uh, Steve quickly joined after. And uh, I thought, well, this is pretty good. I mean, it's a, you know, it, it's, it's this thing, it was, you know, if I, it's only got four wires and only two of them do anything. So I figured that maybe if I do a good job in this project, they'd give me a real job someday. And um, who, who would know that it was going to be 2.2 billion units a year. The, um, so after PCI USB, I started running a bunch of desktop technologies and I did that for a whole long time. And uh, then a bunch of server technologies. And so I've uh, kind of found my niche. I, uh, I've been driving probably more technology initiatives than probably almost anybody on the planet, on the planet and probably tied with these guys. So it's uh, it's been a fun ride. It's uh, it's 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 been uh, it's been great. So we're here to answer your questions on uh, PCI Express or USB or PCI uh, from the past to the present. The um, anything to do with uh, just enabling in general? How do we how do we do initiatives at Intel and how do we work with some of the key players in the industry to, to get these products out there. Uh, we do have as giveaways to the people that ask questions, uh, t-shirts, AJ Bat t-shirts that are going for <laughs> exorbitant <laughs> amounts on the, on the web these days. Uh, we also have the other and then there's a general kind of uh, all of us uh, t-shirt as well. So, uh, and maybe uh, if they're really good questions, we might even sign them as well at some point. But, uh, <laughs> so, you know, fire away. Anything uh, is open. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll try and address it. So who's going to get the first t-shirt? I think the t-shirt's getting away. Alright, so we're a wireless compound. We build wireless routers all the time. Currently, most of the radio teams are in the PCI. The PCI Express is sort of the next generation. So how do you see that transition happening for us as the virtual makers tend to be clinging on to the world? I am, I am really surprised that you have PCI radios. Actually, most of the, for example, we have an Intel product um, that has uh, dual radios on a single card. It's WiMAX and Wi-Fi. And WiMAX is usually on USB, and our Wi-Fi is on PCI Express. Um, there, so there is this mini PCI Express card. Most of the uh, laptops today don't have PCI. It's really mini PCI Express. This is on the router side. 
Oh, you're talking the router. I think uh, at least the PC ecosystem has gone there. And uh, there are a ton of collaterals available. So it's, I don't think there is any new definition work that needs to be done. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is that these things already exist. They have been done this way for last uh, four plus years. I think the, the, it brings up, a, I think, a, an interesting point, though, because when, when we design these new bus interfaces in this case, uh, it, it's, it's amazing how many periphery markets come forward. And, and, and uh, I'll just use USB as an example. I mean, almost every day my phone would ring and say, you know, hey, Jim, we love your, we love your USB bus, but, you know, you know it's only a, you know, a buck a port or whatever. And we, uh, the only thing is I, I, you know, I need it to go further, so I'd like it to go a kilometer. And I said, well, sorry, you should use Ethernet. And they said, no, no, Ethernet's too expensive. And, I say sorry, and then after somebody else wanted it for you know the I forget one thing after another. The, the one I loved the, the best was the uh, guy who was doing underwater dive computers and wanted us to uh, uh, modify USB so he could use them in underwater dive computers and the waterproof connectors or something. <clears throat> and um, the the point is, we just said no. I mean, we were extremely focused on the PC industry, and the we were. Um, we, we created open specifications, but we were focused on what our, our, our job was. Our job was to make something for the PC industry. And, and we told all these other groups that you could, um, oh, most of the time they would say that if you, if you can't, if you don't make these changes, it's not applicable to us. And we just said, no, but if you want to take it and do whatever you want with it afterwards, that's fine. We know what we're trying to accomplish. And, but yet when you look in retrospect, all of these other, except maybe the underwater dive computers, all of these other markets really, you know, took and used the buses that we use, whether it be PCI Express, USB, PCI, as is, so. I was thinking of something else as you branched off. Uh, and you probably recall this, as I say, as you were defining PCI and uh, USB, it's amazing how many people thought that we were going to take away all the legacy connectors and ports right away. And there was mail after mail from where those ports have been adopted outside the PC market, saying please don't take away the keyboard port or the joystick port or the panel port, because we still want it around for compatibility reasons. And those other ecosystems, even the PC market doesn't need it anymore. And of course, we all know that it takes forever to get rid of even in the PC market. So I'm not surprised to hear that PCI still exists outside the PC market. But as I just said, it's probably a good time to redesign it because it's cheaper to do it on PCI Express than the technology already there. Plus with the silicon, plus the silicon technology that we use nowadays for, you know, computers, you can't even support 5.5 low IO, 3. I mean, it, you can, but it is awfully difficult to do that, right? These uh, silicon technology usually by some other one one volt, one and a half volt kind of swings. Even supporting two and a half volt swing for memories is painful. I, 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 question. I just want to tell one, one quick story here because around the legacy, this, this triggered a, a, a really fond memory. One day I was talking to Mr. Michael Slater, and some of you might be, I remember Michael Slater, he used to run microprocessor report, and probably one of the smartest people in the world that I know. And uh, he, he was telling me, he got a letter from someone who said, you know, he had written an article about legacy removal. And he, he got a letter from someone and says, Dear Mr. Slater, you are clueless. He says, I've, I've got $300 invested in ISA cards. It'll be a cold day in hell before <laughs> I'd ever buy a computer that didn't support ISA. So Michael was telling the story. And he says, he looked at his computer for screen. He, he first, he was just going to delete it. And he, he sat there for a second. And he, he decided to respond. And he said, no. Uh, he says, you know, he says, no, never mind the fact that you can replace those ISA, three hundred dollars with the ISA cards, probably for fifteen bucks. He says, you know, uh, dear Mr. Smith, um, thank you for your note. I'm afraid for the good of the entire computer industry, we're going to have to leave you behind. <laughs> okay. Let's take another question. This guy. Yeah. The USB question. Uh, what's happening with link problem management for USB 2.0? The specs we know for two years. <clears throat> there is silicon, there is software out there in devices, 
but there doesn't seem to be any hosts. So leak power as in delivering power or no, the no, leak no. states? <coughs> the, the leak states, the low power, the, the L1 sleep. So this is a classic in the whole platform, as I said, you know, commented on it earlier. You can get the I.O. to make that transition on the I.O. side, but getting the whole platform to make the transition is usually a challenge. <coughs> right? And putting the platform to sleep requires every subsystem to be cooperative, link states to work, right? the controller to work, the memory subsystem to work, and the CPU to be allowed to sleep without being woken up. And it's, it's, we are there, right? I think it's a major issue for us to work with, uh, not just for USB, Right, for every IO subsystem in the platform. And I think the transition from desktops to notebooks to netbooks to mints to handhelds, where the technology is going down to where the battery usage has got to be based on if you're doing work, keep the system alive. If you're not doing any useful work, please shut it down. That philosophy has to be built into everything that we design in, both ends of the wire. And I think it's an industry call to action that you're seeing. Uh, yeah, because People told the device industry to get their act together and do it, and they don't fall off. I think um, so, so that some of the devices that we've integrated on mobile motherboards, like Bluetooth radios and stuff, they are supporting some of the states. Um, yes, with open band signaling. Yes. Um, and so what I'm trying to say is that the first phase of that has started. Um, as you go on the link itself, there is much more work to be done. Um, and the thing is, you know, when you uh, USB has been around for s such a long time, right? Um, that retrofitting, fitting something, will normally take a lot longer, right? because it's been there. Some people say, "Well, I'm going to change my design and make new investments." Other people say, "I'm not going to change it." Right? I mean, that's the difficulty you face. I was thinking of back in the mid-90s, uh, what Mossberg would rail on the PC industry for treating the consumers as, you know, guinea pigs, putting out the techie, you know, stuff out there without really running through the course of uh, usability testing or making sure that it's fully thought through, and then going to fix it after the fact. And we had actually used a few round table, some of you will remember, you know, the industry participation, just collecting service and support call information and what caused people to be frustrated with the installation, with the up upgrades, with hot plug, all these things. We worked on that as an industry along with the OS and the BIOS. But really that's what will take all over again to be able to get power management at that level of finance where, you know, your battery lasts a day, right on a laptop. <coughs> Which is, I think, part of what Ajay is talking about, where right? it's a platform initiative. Those are huge things for us to be able to do. All right, let's take another question. So, uh, USB 3, I'm curious um, how you guys see the rollout of USB 3 compared to the initial rollout of USB 3. And just as eventually USB 2 pretty much did away with a lot of those things. How do you feel about SATA and display ports now that content protection is coming up in USB? So several questions there, right? One is I think you asked about what the platform integration path would be. That's one. Second is where is the convergence? And the third I think is content protection. What are the three questions? Okay. So I take one and then pass it down. Please go. Pick one. <laughs> no, I think you're going to come three times. You know, you have a cyclic dependency in terms of peripherals moving right from USB 1 to USB 2 and USB 2 to USB 3. And when we went at USB 2, one of the questions we had on the table was, what if there's a mix of ports in the system? We asked these a few round table to go profile the system. Let's see, you know, half the ports in the system on USB 2, other half on USB 1. What's the user experience when you buy a USB 2 peripheral plug into a USB 1 port? Thankfully, we never had to encounter that because all the ports move simultaneously from USB 1 to USB 2. So the user never had to work on <coughs> USB 3, we are still keeping our fingers crossed because there isn't a need for all your ports in your system to move from USB 2 to USB 3. And second, there's a lot of ports inside the system and outside the system for all of them to be justifiably you know, moved from 480 to 5K. So there's a usability question there that the OS has to 
know, make it graceful. Uh, the second question though is, what's the momentum of peripherals coming on board? And what's the killer application that's going to drive the adoption of USB 3 in the peripheral market? And so you have a classic chicken and egg. You've got to get the ports out there, you've got to get the compliance certification, and initially you want to go with something that's an add-on, where you can justify the cost in the enthusiast segment, to get the high-end peripherals going there, so the user experience gets driven by the large capacity, if you want the large capacity storage, user experience, then the water falls down into integration. And that's the same path we have for USB 2. I think that's what you see with USB 3. Now, that, you know, we all know that happens fairly rapidly in the PC market, so a year or two it will all be done. But I think you won't see it on a knife edge. So, and the same thing goes in legacy of mode, right? You see that more compact systems being the one that take off the legacy first, and the full feature systems are the ones that lag the removal of that battle port or uh, you know, any other PCI port or whatever it is. What was the other question? Uh, content protection. I, protection. I didn't quite, uh, so can you restate your question please? Well, among the things I, I noticed, you know, there's a fair amount of, and I'm going to use these things also, these days, not these days. Um, but at any rate, um, it looks like USB 3 is kind of positioned to get rid of some other interfaces. They're starting to work on content protection for video. It looks like there's a fair amount of interest in USB 3 for a main storage as opposed to what's out there today. Okay. So I think um, you, what's really, if you look at some of the trends, what's happening is the system price points are going down. So people are looking at all sorts of ways to reduce the cost, to look for consolidation opportunities, right? Also, with this new versus of the old compatibility rules are not valid anymore, you know. You now have capability to even, you know, if you go to Win7, you can actually boot from USB drive, or you can actually upgrade your system using USB drive. So some of the traditional issues that we had are sort of not there anymore. You know, in, in the past, booting from USB was difficult. So anyways, now I think you know the consolidation will happen at the market rate and it will happen because of rules of economics. Architecturally, you know, uh, you can say that USB can do all these things. So can PC Express. Uh, so it really comes down to business issue you know, how people manage the transition. Yeah. I mean, so, uh, I'm just giving you a technical yeah. opinion. So speaking of security, though, remember when um, IT departments used to fill up the USB ports full of super glue? Yeah. Still do? Now, the content, <laughs> the, the content protection is a little harder, actually. Um, usually when you have a premium content, and I think you're talking about USB as a display. Right. I think that is a harder problem. Today, you know, uh, when you have PC <coughs> time board, um, you go through HTCP encryption, and then the bit strings go out. So the whole idea is that digital content is very valuable, and you can make multiple copies without, uh, uh, you know, quality loss. So content protection is difficult to do because anytime you have something in the screen memory or in your display buffer and say you take that stuff and send it to a USB buffer, basically your OS or your content policy will shut that down. You won't be able to send the bits. Right? Because this is actually controlled by these days uh, OS, they, there's, in PCs there's something called PAVP, Protected Audio Video Path. Um, so unless you go tackle those problems, I think for USB to go solve, I don't know who's working on these things, but they will have to actually go do a lot of work to make sure that you have a path into an encrypted buffer and then put this stuff out. Um, for appliances and other things, it is easy in PCs. You know, one could mount an attack, and that is much harder. I think it is probably going to take longer than one would think. Yeah. 
Let's take another question. That's you okay. I think the um, I think the answer is yes, driven by SSDs. Yeah, eventually. Given that, would PCI go outside the box and network cable be available? You know, there's you know, through with PCI Express, we. We had them. I still have them. There's, there's, there's actually is a, a spec for it. There's a cable spec. Nobody's, nobody's uh, uh, of significance, I don't think, has implemented anything on it. But in term, inside the box, there's SSDs are, are going to change the shape of PCs. The signaling, very, very on, the signaling on PC Express really works mm -hmm. rather nicely on cables. It actually came from cable world. 8 bit NB encoded. It's a system partitioning issue, right? If it makes sense from a system partitioning cost, service and support, there's got to be something that will make that transition happen. Uh, you heard the keynote this morning from Sean, right? He was talking about uh, spindles going away and uh, SSDs coming online, which lets you do a lot more behind standard interfaces like PCI, PC Express, USB, than what you could do behind uh, SATA, rotating medium kind of thing. Just because the streaming performance can be a lot better than what you can get from a spindle. Right? You can scale much better by parallelism and buffering. And so that's the incentive. So if you get the density, get the power down, and get the, the, you know, the amount of storage to the bandwidth right, to scale better, there's incentive to do something along those lines. It's a, it's a cost transition. There's another aspect also uh, when you look USB, uh, SATA, they're basically networky type of messaging uh, systems, right? Interfaces. And PCI Express fundamentally, a uh, device has a, uh, access to the other, uh, other space on the, on the platform. So having ability to access from the outside into the box uh, when we don't have all of that plumbing security would be, uh, you know, totally. So an ecosystem needs to, needs to be brought to the, to the level that uh, we can have decent protection. There are certain things for IO virtualization that we're already doing on the platform, but needs to be brought to the next level before something like that could be entertained. We need to get some like a question there. Well, turn them around faster because on the mic. people want, want t shirts here, you know. <laughs> I'd like to know what was it about USB 3.0 that allowed you to go over twisted pair cable, whereas other standards at the same kind of data rate had to go over twin X cable, like uh, SATA and InfiniBand use twin X. Length. With, it's a distance. Distance. Just keep oh, it at Because you're shorter length? Yeah. Or you, Three to five meters is not that big for this well, customer. SATA is also in that same length, isn't it? I don't know why SATA picked uh, what they picked, but uh, at least for USB. It's, you know, shorter distance, there's hardly any loss of signal. It's been about 17 meters, if I remember right. Let's take a question here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, oh, sorry, just let's take, and well, we'll come back to you again. So, um, everybody can get a t-shirt, so. Yeah, know. everybody can get t-shirts. Yeah. So. Okay, we have enough for everybody. Use the over IP. Is that going to be standard? Use the over IP or IP over USB? Is that something? You know, the voting, the voting USB at the other end of an IP link. Yep. I think there have been prototypes of that. I've not seen anybody ship such a product. There's no standard. There's no standard. standard. Are you guys going to stand? Is there a need for it that you see? What would be the application model? What would you do? Just curious. Remote computing, for example. Remote computing, remote computing, where you have the PC, some office, you just have the monitoring. And where do you see the standardization happening? What interface? Actually, I, I saw a uh, demo from MIT years ago where uh, they had a force feedback device that was operating. So this is medical applications where you have a force feedback device there in their demo. And you could, doctor could be at remote site and could operate on the patient. So they were sort of, so that's where you would do something like that. So the device was connected to USB. Um, is that something USB concerns would want to do? You know, there, there are things that you won't want to standardize because 
people want to use this in a general application and there are always these specialized applications that are best done in a differentiated way, application by application. I really don't see, this is again personal opinion, um, huge market for this. You know, how many people are doing remote force feedback kind of stuff? I mean, you could conceive, you know, games and stuff. Yeah, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, you know, and obviously that's not the only application, and, and right. certainly yeah, it could, it could, it could unload, yeah. it could unleash, you know, a, a wide range of, of applications. There, there's a dynamic that happens. Usually, there's critical mass of, of of people who are identifying a problem that's getting getting in the way of the industry, and, and there's some activation energy it takes to get over that. Um, and then we, you know, the industry kind of gets together and they start working on a problem. I, I, I think that, you know, the fact that it hasn't been standardized is the fact that enough people aren't caring about that. It's typically the way it happens and it's, um, I mean, it's not like a... Uh, There's no architectural limitation. It right. is just somebody doing the work yeah. in Windows environment. It's, it's, it's not like the Wizard of Oz where you go up and there's somebody behind the curtain who decides what's going to be and what's not. It, it, it comes from people who want to make these things happen, you know, roll up their sleeves and, and get the work done. So, you know, I think that that's what I meant about having enough of the... It's working with, you know, a group of companies and taking that requirements into the, uh, into the USB implementers form. Setting up a logo real quick for the process. Yeah. <coughs> No, I don't know. Again, the ponderance of, you know, the, the, the usage model is substantial, that it causes in the market to emerge. There is a process, the device working group. They meet every two months and uh, they present the work by them to USB either board of directors and the case approves or rejected. I mean, we, we see device working groups getting formed all the time. Yeah. What, what is the focus of the USB? I mean, everything generated is faster. There's a, there's a couple of classes on USB tomorrow, so okay. that's probably the best way to get the latest on. Yeah. Who is this? Actually, back. I think you're all right. We can't get all. Can you come to the microphone? Like, I couldn't quite. Yeah. So do you think there are any major technical challenges and ecosystem enablement challenges for this year in Gen 3? You know, it, we need to be frank and say that there are always challenges. When we transitioned from PCI Express Gen 1 to Gen 2, there was obviously a speed bump of 2x uh, and it wasn't trivial. Uh, when we looked uh, third generation of PCI Express, Initially, proposal was to look 10 giga uh, transfers per second, 10 giga signaling technology, which we found that will break the compatibility with the ecosystem, would require more expensive materials, connectors, and, and simply it would, uh, it would uh, have high probability of a problem. That's why we reduced the speed down to 8 giga transfers per second and decided to regain the, the bandwidth by changing the encoding scheme. So PCI Express Gen 3 already brings the trade-offs that make it uh, more feasible, more viable transition from the Gen 2 to Gen 3. Not trying to trivialize the problem, but I think uh, those trade-offs will, will increase the probability of success of the technology. And it's the same people who did uh, first and second generation, so uh, I believe that uh, experts did their job and that we will see the Gen 3 being fairly successfully deployed. We have at least a, a dozen active companies designing, you know, uh, right. uh, PCI Express 3.0 products and, you know, to and, and one power one sometime next year. So it's integration challenge, right? Each of the elements you know how to do, right? You know how to do the electrical, you know how to do the, the config, you know how to do the enhancements of the protocol. It's putting it all together and getting the new compliance power. So we go through that process, then there's enough people coming up with their prototypes. You know how the process runs in terms of uh, putting on development systems, compliance workshops, getting certification done, and we go through the same process for Gentry. And that's what we know how to do with high volumes. You're saying that uh, end of next year you could have this great Gentry by trials in the market. 
No, I said, I think that there are people who are planning to power on sometime next year, I guess is what I would say. I don't, when, it, when they launch, I don't know, There's, but there are a, a lot of designs, you know, designs take a long time, A, to get your first silicon on, and then once you get first silicon, it takes a long time to ship on. I'm confident within a couple of years, you'll probably see something, and you'll probably see demos and stuff earlier than that. Even my spec has gone out yet. All right, let's take another couple of questions. We're over time, but you know, you're welcome to stay. We're okay, so. We're still, we're standing between you and beer, so we understand <laughs> if you get, you know. Martini. Martinis. <laughs> Any other questions? Any other burning questions? <clears throat> On that legacy front, um, you know, the LPC bus is uh, the ICE's uh, son, if you will. Yes. But uh, it doesn't seem to, we can't seem to get rid of it. Do you see any way uh, in the near future that that can be uh, eliminated or replaced? Yeah, well, um, today. We look at it once a year. Well, well we, we do look at it. And I think there are probably, I, I also ask this question why can't that move to Pisa Express? And the reason that is given to me is that some of the devices that sit on LPC, like EC, embedded controller. Yeah. Um, it is a very inexpensive device and they can't deal with complexity of PCI Express. I don't know how much of that is true, you know, uh, six, seven years after the first PCI Express was launched, I would think it would make your life easy, yeah. right? Um, Legacy removal is just tough in our industry. And it's, you know, and, and one of the reasons is because it's a horizontal industry. So if somebody takes something out, their competitors will say, look, at, look at those guys took this thing out and, you, you know, we still provide it. There are not that many devices now that are left on them. In, 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 in 1987. I think it is mainly EC, right? And then it's a lot better than that. But that's all part of EC. But I mean, keyboard, mouse, everything else is already gone. It's already gone. I mean, these days, you know, I just got a PC and it doesn't even have legacy ports. And, and, and as you said earlier, the lower end systems are already eliminated. This, yeah. this chip says, oh, it's just kind of important. So I, I think time may have come, uh, I don't know uh, if everybody's ready, but time may have come. With the demand of the DMC is a lot, but you need the cost of study at least a But at least I spread the stress of number that is not available. Right? Spy is a benefit. Uh, oh, Spy is, so spy Flash is already on Spy. spy. So, uh, yeah, even, um, there may be a way to solve these things. But this is also an interesting example how we tried to remove the legacy and created the new kind of breed of legacy. LPC was invented in a chipset uh, architecture group as a way partition out the component that will have a legacy stuff, 8259 keyboard control and so on. And we, uh, you know, build the ecosystem with a number of vendors that produce the inexpensive parts. Well, what happened over time, they sneaked in some other additional value added yeah. functionality that now after the old uh, legacy functions were gone, now that it's it's established or established as a new sort of legacy in terms that LPC became a legacy. It's just, it's and just LPC hard. is really just a, you know, very simple uh, I would say trivial. It's really it's low up. cost, and that's that's the compellingness so of LPC. Too, right? See, yeah. so this uh, boot time issue with Pisa Express that you pointed out, that could, that's a small problem because whether it is PCI or Pisa Express, that that's a small problem. The real issue is that of economics, is that of what complexity you can deal with, and we we keep asking this question again and again. Uh, and if everybody's ready, maybe the time may have come to make a proposal. Question over there. <coughs> when the market can afford it. <laughs> yes. So, uh, it, yeah, we're starting to get over the next couple of years into the types of bandwidths where, you know, moving from copper is seriously being looked at. Mm -hmm. But it, it's expensive. Uh, it's obviously moved, you know, from outside the box capability. You know, you, you can, a lot of the racks are, are using optical today. That's predominantly uh, the main interconnect. But inside the box, where you, you're looking at PCI Express, um, people are going to try and squeeze out as much life on copper as they can. And uh, you know, certainly that seems to be the case over the next 
you know, five years or so. So it's probably, um, you know, from a high volume manufacturing point of view and, you know, a, you know, commodity type of perspective, it's going to be a while. But you'll certainly start to see some applications, uh, maybe in the next uh, year or two, something like that. It's, ultimately, it has to happen. If you look off far enough, there, there's no, you know, there's no way around it, right? Because if we were in the world where you travel intercontinentally on boats, you can continue to try to make boats faster. At some point, you need a better technology, right? And so that's, it, so, you know, we're, we're getting about as far as we're going to get on, on copper. We can maybe squeeze another generation. It was a miracle, maybe we get two. But at some point, something's going to have to give here. Also, the just group because group five comment uh, from uh, you heard the group three, group five comment on one of the keynotes from uh, gentleman from MIT. Uh, oh, you missed that. Okay, well, so the point is, as silicon technology brings in other elements in the periodic table that are more friendly to integrating optics, that's probably one of the critical points too. The fiber obviously is not the cost, right? Telecom, you know, has generated yeah. cheap fiber. It's just a question of what distances the crossover is. We know the distances in a few meters at this point. Yeah. We're certainly showing a lot of demos on optical in the, in the showcase. And we've talked about it, you know, we've looked at silicon photonics and discrete pixel-based systems. So there's a lot of research going on, probably moving more into development now, but you know, still a you know, little ways from uh, shipping in volume in any, in it, any way. Okay. What's that space? Uh, I think we're running out of time in terms of uh, other, uh, other commitments. So, uh, Come and get a t-shirt. Uh, thanks for coming tonight.